The Kwisatz Haderach, or the shortening of the way, is the pinnacle of human evolution as desired by the goals of the Bene Gesserit's artificial selection breeding program. The Kwisatz Haderach to Frank Herbert represents an exceptionally dangerous superhuman, and is in many ways a subtle critique of both the trends becoming popular in science fiction from the 40s onwards, as well as the inherent dangers in blindly following leaders who are exalted by the general population. When Paul innocently asks the Reverend Mother Gaia's Helen Mohim, You say maybe I'm the Kwisatz Sadarak, what's that? A human gum jabbar? He little realises he is quite correct. The Bene Gesserit view the Kwisatz Sadarak as the person who can be in many places at once, possessing the ability to see into both male and female other memory. The Bene Gesserit breeding program that is intended to produce the Kwisatz Sadarak is essentially disrupted by Jessica when she bears a son to the Atreides, and thus bringing the culmination of the plan into being, one generation early. The Bene Gesserit had intended Jessica to bear a female child to the Atreides, with the notion of breeding her with the Baron Harkonnen's nephew, Fade Rautha. The union of the Atreides' daughter and Harkonnen male would then produce a male child who would become the Kwisatz Sadarak, and who would be under the control of the Bene Gesserit. Unbeknownst to Jessica, as the Bene Gesserit often conceals the heritage of individuals involved in the breeding program, the Baron Harkonnen is actually her biological father. There are a number of characters in the Dune series who can be viewed as potential Kwisatz Haderachs, failed Kwisatz Haderachs, or even those who are something beyond the original intent of such a being. Paul himself, supposedly the first Kwisatz Haderach, tells his mother that he is in fact not what the Bene Gesserit have sought to create. As his mother considers the fact that he may be in fact the culmination of the sister's breeding program, he tells her that he is in fact something else. Jessica pressed her hands to her mouth. Great mother, he's the Kwisatz Haderach. She felt exposed and naked before him, realising then that he saw her with eyes from which little could be hidden, and that, she knew, was the basis of her fear. You're thinking I'm the Kwisatz Sadarak, he said. Put that out of your mind. I'm something unexpected. Paul does, however, admit to being the Kwisatz Sadarak, although there is also the implication that he is indeed something more. At one point, describing his own self as a seed, while he realises that he has some terrible purpose. He does however admit, as his abilities develop, that he can deny it no longer. In a sense the breeding programme of the Bene Gesserit is not just created to serve the sisterhood's needs, preferring as they do to operate in their political intentions from behind the scenes. In the years following the Butlerian Jihad, humanity has flourished and diversified, but as the Imperium settled over a period of thousands of years, Mankind is finally stagnating. The Kwisatz Sadarak is indeed a human, or rather post-human, Gom Jabbar, who will become the crucible that helps sort the wheat from the chaff in order to help mankind survive some previously unforeseen disaster. Paul as a Kwisatz Sadarak has more than the Bene Gesserit abilities learned under his mother's tutelage and the powers granted him by other memory. That which is unforeseen in him is his ability of almost complete prescience, showing him the paths that lie ahead for humankind. Here was the race consciousness that he had known once as his own terrible purpose. Here was reason enough for a Kwisatz Sadarak or a Lisan al Gaib, or even the halting schemes of the Bene Gesserit. The race of humans had felt its own dormancy, sensed itself grown stale, and knew now only the need to experience turmoil in which the genes would mingle and the strong new mixtures survive. All humans were alive as an unconscious single organism in this moment, experiencing a kind of sexual heat that could override any barrier. Paul's transition from talented, well-trained and educated ducal heir to that of Kwisatz Haderach does not happen overnight and is in fact a slow and painful process for the youth. His relocation to the planet Arrakis has a great deal to do with his gradual development as the spice melanges everywhere, saturating food, drink and even the air he breathes.
This helps in slowly altering Paul's awareness. There are indications of his prescient vision and truth sense from the early stages of the novel, but it is not until he faces the crucial trial of drinking the water of life in the spice agony that he reaches the complete potential of a fully realised Kwisatz Sadarak. Paul, after drinking the water of life, remains in a coma for three weeks, an unusual length of time for the spice agony. The following passage occurs immediately after Paul awakens from his coma and he reveals to his mother the true nature of the Kwisatz Sadarak and his terrible purpose. It is immediately after this awakening that Paul takes decisive action against all opposing parties involved with Arrakis and spice production, leading his Fremen armies against them and threatening to destroy the source of Melange once and for all. Paul! Jessica screamed. He grabbed her hand, faced her with a death's head grin, and he sent his awareness surging over her. The rapport was not as tender, not as sharing, not as encompassing as it had been with Ali and with the old Reverend Mother in the cavern, but it was a rapport. A sense sharing of the entire being. It shook her, weakened her, and she cowered in her mind, fearful of him. Aloud, he said, You speak of a place where you cannot enter? This place which the Reverend Mother cannot face, show it to me. She shook her head, terrified by the very thought, Show it to me, he commanded. No! But she could not escape him. Bludgeoned by the terrible force of him, she closed her eyes and focused inward, the direction that is dark. Paul's consciousness flowed through and around her and into the darkness. She glimpsed the place dimly before her mind blanked itself away from the terror. Without knowing why, her whole being trembled at what she had seen, a region where a wind blew and sparks glared, where rings of light expanded and contracted, where rows of tumescent white shapes flowed over and under and around the lights, driven by darkness and a wind out of nowhere. Presently, she opened her eyes, saw Paul staring up at her. He still held her hand, but the terrible rapport was gone. She quieted her trembling. Paul released her hand. It was as though some crutch had been removed. She staggered up and back, would have fallen had not Chani jumped to support her. Reverend Mother, Chani said, what is wrong? Tired, Jessica whispered. So, tired. Here, Chani said, sit here. She helped Jessica to a cushion against the wall. The strong young arms felt so good to Jessica, she clung to Chani. He has, in truth, seen the water of life? Chani asked. She disengaged herself from Jessica's grip. He has seen, Jessica whispered. Her mind still rolled and surged from the contact. It was like stepping to solid land after weeks on a heaving sea. She sensed the old Reverend Mother within her, and all the others awakened and questioning. What was that? What happened? Where was that place? Through it all threaded the realisation that her son was the Kwisad Sadarak, the one who could be many places at once. He was the fact out of the Bene Gesserit dream, and the fact gave her no peace. What happened? Chani demanded. Jessica shook her head. Paul said, There is in each of us an ancient force that takes and an ancient force that gives. A man finds little difficulty facing that place within himself where the taking force dwells, but it's almost impossible for him to see into the giving force without changing into something other than man. For a woman, the situation is reversed. Jessica looked up, found Chani was staring at her while listening to Paul. Do you understand me, mother? Paul asked. She could only nod. These things are so ancient within us, Paul said that they're ground into each separate cell of our bodies, we're shaped by such forces. You can say to yourself, yes, I see how such a thing may be, but when you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see your peril. You see that this could overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. It's as easy to be overwhelmed by giving as by taking. And you, my son? Jessica asked. Are you one who gives? 
or one who takes? I am at the fulcrum, he said. I cannot give without taking, and I cannot take without. He broke off, looking to the wall at his right. The role of the Kwisatz Sadarach, then, is to guide humanity down the golden path, the desired route to a future that ensures humanity's survival via harsh oppression and the death of billions. Those that survive it will emerge stronger and more varied, allowing humanity to persist. Humanity will survive the rigours of the golden path, which is in itself a form of universe-wide natural selection created by the ultimate predator. It is Paul's ultimate failing that as much as he initiates the golden path, creating his own religion with fanatical warriors who depart on an eleven-year genocidal jihad, he is unable to see it through. It is the price that he must pay which is too great, completely sacrificing his humanity in order to save mankind, that prevents him from carrying out the golden path. It is his pre-born son Leto II who is capable of making such a sacrifice, becoming the almost completely inhuman tyrant, the God Emperor, who has the will and determination to carry out the golden path. Paul's abilities are not quite the same as his son's, having curiously odd gaps in his prescient vision at key nexus points of the golden path. At the critical moment of action in the narrative of Dune, where he faces the Emperor and slays Fade Rautha, his future is uncertain. When the Emperor Shaddam IV asks his companion and chief intriguer, Count Hazemir Fenring, to kill Paul, the two individuals study each other using the Bene Gesserit skills they have been taught, and Paul realises that his opponent is invisible to his prescient sight because he is a potential Kwisatz Haderach. The Count focused on Paul, saying with eyes his Lady Margot had trained in the Bene Gesserit way, aware of the mystery and hidden grandeur about this Atreides youth. I could kill him, Fenering thought, and he knew this for a truth. Something in his own secretive depth stayed the Count then, and he glimpsed briefly, inadequately, the advantage he held over Paul, a way of hiding from the youth, a furtiveness of person and motives that no eye could penetrate. Paul, aware of some of this from the way the time nexus boiled, understood at last why he had never seen Fenring along the webs of prescience. Fenring was one of the might have beens, an almost Kwisatz Sadarach, crippled by a flaw in the genetic pattern, a eunuch, his talent concentrated into furtiveness and inner seclusion. A deep compassion for the Count flowed through Paul, the first sense of brotherhood he'd ever experienced. In June Messiah, the Benny Tleilax face dancer, Skytail, reveals to his fellow conspirators that the Tleilaxu had also bred a Kwisatz Sadarach using their techniques of genetic engineering. Irulan asks him how the Tleilaxu were able to control their Kwisatz Sadarach, to which the face dancer informs her that they were not. He informs her that their Kwisatz Sadarach preferred to die rather than become the antithesis of the representation of his self. The suicide of the Tleilaxu Kwisatz Sadarach echoes strongly the idea of Samuel Butler's pre erewhonian civilization, the race of men who had come before their descendants and had all died off within a few short months. It is not stated in Erewhon whether these men killed themselves, but it can be safe to propose that this was the author's unspoken suggestion, in that he quite specifically mentions that their deaths were caused by the misery their prescience brought them. <laughs>